Well, this is a great turnout being at 430, as I was saying earlier, on a, a Friday here in beautiful Pittsburgh. So uh, we'll try to go through this fast. The handout that you have, and I hope everybody has it, will help you then to take some notes and follow along. Even you'll see a lot of the, uh, the images. Well, my first point this, this afternoon is I need to recognize some other folks. Some of you have heard uh, me and Jim Chatfield and Eric Draper do this talk together. Uh, as you can see, my cohorts and I, we often point counterpoint, and that's the whole idea behind the way that we teach. Also, uh, your handout is based on this fact sheet. Uh, if you go, if you want to write this down, it's OSU, um, oh shoot, it's, uh, if you just type in um, uh, Ohio line, if you do a Google search, one word, Ohio line, you can get to this fact sheet. And also, the 21st question uh, in uh, the June issue of the American Nurseryman uh, goes along with this as well. So just some background things. Sources of information. Uh, unfortunately, this has come to an end for the season, but from <clears throat> April through October, many of you already get this, already avail yourselves of this. The Buckeye Yard and Garden Line is a weekly electronic newsletter produced by uh, Extension uh, educators, specialists, researchers. We meet once a week on Tuesday morning to discuss what's happening and what to do about it. And then we write it up every week. Uh, if you print it out, it's about uh, usually 10 to 14 pages of what's going on. For example, you can see galls uh, or emerald a or Asian longhorn beetle and so forth. My second point, why is a correct diagnosis important? That's what we're going to talk about today, diagnostics. Why is it important to correctly diagnose plant problems? Now, this is a good group. I realize it's late Friday afternoon, and some of you have caught on to what I learned in graduate school and oral exams. If you don't know the answer, it's okay to mumble. <laughs> yeah, 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 he got it. Did you hear that? If you repeat that a little louder. <laughs> a correct diagnosis... Treatment without a correct diagnosis is malpractice. No different in our profession as to the medical profession. Same idea. If we take the wrong path, if we treat because we've made a wrong diagnosis, uh, that's not a very good thing. But there are problems with diagnostics. We've all experienced this. Some plant problems are very obvious while others are very obscure. Some problems are not going to be diagnosed with your first effort. As a matter of fact, I imagine everyone in this room has in their head a plant problem they've run across, a tree problem they've run across that still remains unsolved. Anytime you're doing this for any length of time, that'll happen. Of course, while we're trying to figure out, people want immediate answers, right? Mm -hmm. They want you to say right now what the problem is. So some problems are very obvious. You don't have to do anything more than just identify Japanese beetles, right? Even if you see the skeletonized linden leaves, the damage alone is pretty straightforward, right? There really isn't much else that skeletonizes linden leaves that looks like this. Obvious problems. Top dieback. Well, that could just be an exhausted arborvitae. It's slam dunk. Very obvious. Some problems are very obscure. Bark splitting. Man, if you want to get tree care people in a debate, just bring up the causes of bark splitting, right? They are manifold. And everybody will declare, well, it's this. It's, uh, it's freeze damage. Oh, no, no, it's Roundup exposure. Oh, no, no, it's... All these things can contribute to bark splitting. But it's rather obscure because sometimes it's very hard to figure out exactly what was the culprit, unless the culprit's still there. Some problems won't be diagnosed on your first effort. This, was, uh, this is a canine fir. This happens to be actually in a Christmas tree plantation. And uh, if you look closely, remember firs and spruces have a, a spiral vascular system. So if you have a problem down below, those symptoms will spiral up the tree. And you can kind of see that with this image. Get a little closer, a little closer, and you can see that this is spiraling up and what you have is vascular tissue that uh, the image, I, I apologize, just doesn't do it really good justice but it's almost blackish gray. Every type of, <clears throat> our clinic performed every type of test on this, uh, this tissue and nothing came back positive. 
we don't know what caused this problem, this sectional dieback. We have some suspicions, but no smoking guns. Some problems won't be diagnosed. And the whole time this is going on, people want immediate answers. They want to know it now, right? I want to know what's wrong. Can lead to desperate diagnosis. We've all felt this way, right? Maybe it ought to come to me. It could just be sickening, I tell you. Brings me to my third point, and this is a big point. Don't make symptoms fit the diagnosis. Do make the diagnosis fit the symptoms. Of all things I'm going to say today, you know, I'm going to risk something to say, well, this is the most important thing I was going to say today, but I have a feeling that if you're given the time, you just all run out like I would. But the fact is, this is where we can go wrong under pressure, right? Because we don't want to be perceived as not knowing. Worse, we don't want to be wrong. Worse than that, we don't want to be perceived as being not knowing and wrong by the clients, right? That's a human nature thing. But under pressure, you can decide, well, it must be it. And then everything you see, everything you see convicts. It's the same, it is exactly the same. Think about it with our judicial system. It's exactly the same thing, with the same type of struggles. Same type of struggles. Plant problem diagnostics, and how do we increase our chances of getting it right by asking the right questions? It brings us to these 20 questions today that we have outlined before you, and also have had it in American Nurserymen, and also you saw with the, uh, with the fact sheet. Now, I want to stress something. The 20 questions is a diagnostic learning tool. It is not intended to be used in a way of every problem that you run across, every tree problem, you start going down the list. That's not the idea behind this thing. I mean, we don't want you to call your clients uh, a week later and oh, I'm only up to number 10, I'll call you next week. That's not the idea. The idea is to help me teach or you teach others and us all to learn the diagnostic process. It all started out with this idea that very often when we teach diagnos diagnostics, it becomes show and tell. Pictures of insects, pictures of diseases. But what if the problem is not something that we have a picture of? In 2001, unless you visited China, you would not have known to have taken a picture of an emerald ash borer. In 1995, unless you visited China, you would not have thought to take a picture of an Asian longhorn beetle. So, one goal that we have with this is to help us all to consider what we need to do to discover the undiscoverable. The objective, then, is to learn how to diagnose plant problems. Focus on the diagnostic process. The second point is that there is a the uh, questions are listed in a logical sequence, and there are logical groups to these questions. In fact, even though the handout more or less does one at a time, I think you'll see when we put this together, and again, the proper authors for that is myself and Jim Chatfield and Eric Draper that I presented before. When we put this together, well, let's just get started with the first group. If we look at one, what is the plant? Well, what is the plant automatically leads to what's normal for the plant, which then automatically leads to what are some of the common problems for the plant, for the tree. These are plant-specific questions, meaning know your plant. And I think we all can agree that if you start off with the wrong plant ID, you're going to be in trouble. Because an accurate plant ID means you're more likely to have an accurate plant problem ID. Okay, so what is the plant? Ash. Outstanding ash. So we have ash. All right, and we notice on the ash, oh, he's not this really interesting D-shaped hole. And maybe, just by luck, we see a nice emerald green bore. So again, you see why knowing the plant, plant-specific problems. We even have plant problems, tree problems named for the insects. And so knowing the plant's extremely important. Uh-oh, wait a second. That is not, a, I mean, maybe two emerald ash borer beetles emerged at once. How would you get a nice big round hole like that? Good for you. Somebody got up here. It is an ash borer, but there's something different because emerald ash borer hides its frass. 
I think I'm going to take my mic off right now because I don't want this to be on tape. You guys don't know this, but I'm on videotape. That's why I want it to be dark in here. I look better that way. <laughs> this is a nice little thing. Frass. F-R-A-S-S. -S. What is that? Well, it's not just sawdust. Somebody said it. What? Poop. Bug poop. Excrement. We have a lot of words for excrement. We have one we use all the time when we're, say, you know, mad at each other or... Or beat the poop out. You know, there's another word. We, but now, see, since you all came at 4.30 to listen to an entomologist, you're going to learn a little entomo lingo. <laughs> and so you can say something like this to each other. You can say, oh, man, I feel like frass today. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, I know some of you are going to get up and just look like frass. I mean, I realize. F-R-A-S-S. -S. Two S's? He's taking notes on that, I tell you. They go home and say, uh, man, this meal tastes like frass. And unless you know, somebody's an entomologist, they won't know. You can drive down the road and I cut you off and you yell, frass head! <laughs> and you won't get beat up. Frass. So this thing is putting its frass outside the tree. Emerald ash borer keeps it inside the tree. Also, there's this nice pupil skin. So this might be an ash borer, but it's certainly not emerald ash borer, right? Holes too big, you have frass pupil skin. That is, as one gentleman got it up here, this is the native ash clear wing moth borer. A native. Doesn't matter if it puts its frass outside. In fact, it just loves that. So I'm American. I'm going to throw my frass where I want to. <laughs> I don't care. What is normal for the plant? Natural senescence like fall needle drop with dawn redwood, also eastern uh, white pine. And we can also get this uh, uh, with our American hollies, except it's in the spring, which really can throw people off. And sometimes this can be very synchronous. And I got to tell you, occasionally I still stop and look because when the American holly trees start dropping those inner leaves, it's at the same time they're producing the nice new leaves. And it can, again, be very, very dramatic. What are the common plant uh, problems, uh, common problems with the plant? Specific to the plant, but also there's that word taxonomy. There's no getting around it, folks. We are going to have to be aware of how trees and other plants are related sometimes. There's no getting around it. What's in a name? Kingdom plantae, phylum magnolia phyta, class magnoliopsida. Say that with me, magnoliopsida, magnolia. It's late Friday. And we move down to magnoliaceae, the family, genus, magnolia, oh, liriodendron. Now, it is amazing how many folks look at tulip tree or tulip poplar not realize that it's not a true poplar. It's not populous. It is in a whole different genus. The importance uh, for this, though, is that if we look at the family Magnoliaceae, Magnolia scale, then will affect both. There's also a tulip tree scale that affects both. So knowing relationships, knowing the taxonomy. What do we have that's in the olive family? Aside from ash, that's good. Ash, what else? We have lilacs, forsythia, privet, and, of course, ash. But we need to go down below one, in this case, to the genus Fraxinus. Olive family, genus Fraxinus. And then we go look at some of the species, like common white ash. So we have white ash plus emerald ash borer, and that equals dead ash for the common name. However, the point is, is emerald ash borer will not infest any other plant in the olive family aside from the genus Fraxinus. So only ash. Very important. Korean mountain ash. Does Korean mountain ash become infested by emerald ash borer? No, because what family is Korean mountain ash in? Exactly, rose family. So it can, though, get bacterial fire blight. Won't become infested by emerald ash borer, but rosaceous plants, the rose family plants, can become infected by bacterial fire blight. And of course, we have a lot of plants besides uh, ornamental pear, crab apple, pyracantha, and of course, Korean mountain ash. How did you know, if you didn't even know that Korean mountain ash was in the rose family, how would you know it's not a true ash? 
Oh, that's good. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> What's that? Well, yeah, but no, even just uh, that. Well, that's good. That's good in terms of leaf arrangement. But if you look at the name, it's all in the name. Notice how mountain ash is written as a contraction. When you see something written as a contraction, that means it's not the true form as it's implying. Fireflies are beetles. They're not flies, and they're not on fire. You write fireflies together. May apples aren't tiny apple trees, right? You write may apples together. Just a little side note. What do you see that looks abnormal? What's the overall health and what exactly do you see? We start with what looks abnormal and we're talking about signs and symptoms. And this has to be reviewed for many of you. What are signs? This is the actual part of the insect or pathogen that's being observed. It could be something like these conks coming off the side of a tree. Or it could be this ooze full of little sawdust-like particles that are coming out the back end of a caterpillar, which are called frass, outstanding. So these are signs, because there's the actual causal agent for the problem, as opposed to symptoms, which is the interaction between the plant and the pest or pathogen, which includes things like, like blotches, off-colored leaves, or missing leaves. <coughs> signs and symptoms. There's a sign for a fungus that rots the buttress roots on trees. And there's the symptom. Hap happens to prefer to go after European beach. Now my background is entomology. And I have to tell you though, sometimes I'm very envious of the plant pathologists because they really do have some great names for diseases. This fungus rots the buttress roots, so what do you think it's called? Outstanding. <laughs> Not making it up. There's even another fungus that, that Calls it slimy butt rot. I covered up my mic. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? But beware of symptom mimics. Remember, consider all possibilities in the diagnostics. Here we have shepherd's crooks. What causes the shepherd's crook symptom? Let's just work this out. What causes the symptom? No, no, no. What causes the symptom? No, no, no. What causes the symptom? Uh, what did you say? Desiccation. Outstanding. Everybody hear that? See, you got to, he said desiccation. See, you know, you're talking about cause, and you know, I was talking about cause. What causes it? What causes it is that you had tender tissue. These, these are new shoots. So what time of the year would you have this starting? Spring. In the spring, tender shoot. And something is shutting down the vascular system, which then causes that tender tissue to wilt thus becoming a shepherd's crook. So what causes it? Desiccation, lack of water. This is ornamental pear. And what's on the right was caused by the dreaded two-headed periodical cicada. <laughs> now they don't get very far, far, they're always arguing. No, let's go this way. No, let's go that way. Of course, as we know, the female has this very, very hard ovipositor. She then uses it to jab into the, into the uh, stem tissue and wrecks the vascular tissue. So she can wreck the vascular tissue, destroying vascular flow. And somebody got it a while ago. Bacterial fire blight can also destroy the vascular tissue. Thus you have shepherd's crook created by two very different causal agents. Again, symptom, symptom mimics. Don't ever forget that. Is this a pest or a disease, this bark splitting? Either or. I like that. Boo. Put some emphasis now. Come on. I agree. You know, last election, we elected people that said no more than that. <laughs> well, it's actually both. What's on the right is periodical cicada of a position damage. What's on the left is botrysphere canker. Now that you see it, it, they really do look very different, don't they? But why do they look the same? Well, perfect segue. <laughs> I, I knew this was going to be Friday late and I'm going to work hard. Okay, let's just review some tree growth basics. You know, we all know this in the room. Start with the bark, then we have the phloem, then we have this three cell layer thick ring called the cambium. Those cells do what? 
they become either phloem or the wood of the tree, the xylem. But what happens, as you all know in this room, when we expose cambial cells to oxygen, we get the production of wound tissue or callous tissue. Well, it turns out the reason these both look the same is because you're looking at callous tissue or wound tissue. In this case, the cicada exposed the cambial cells as it was jamming its ovipositor. In the other case, the, fungi, the fungus destroyed tissue, thus exposing the cambial tissue, leading to the exactly the same production of the same type of material. So, symptom mimics. This is why I want to go back to sometimes you have to be careful when someone says, what caused it? You need to sometimes go through what could cause it. What could cause these things to look the same? What is the overall health of the plant? This is our Boriculture 101. Everybody in this room knows this, that when you look at a tree like that and say, well, it's a thinning canopy, get closer and check out the growth rate. To me, this is a wonderful thing that trees give us. Trees give us this ability to, to actually see how well they're doing over time. If we measure the distance between last year's terminal bud and this year's terminal bud, that one year growth rate, and then we go back and look at the previous year, and go back and look at the previous year, you have a record of growth. If you see, obviously, and people, you, I know you've all done this in this room, but let's just kind of review. If you see a gradual declining, the growth rate is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, what can you conclude? It's not growing as fast, but whatever the problem is, has been going on for a time. If you suddenly see last year, the year before, all this was great, 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 and all of a sudden this year was short growth, what does that tell you? Something, something happened, something just happened. Very helpful. And of course, here's ash, there's a, ter there's a terminal scar from last year, terminal bud this year. Same thing as we know with conifers, to be able to look between the whorls. I have to tell you, even I forget to do this very often. Because sometimes we focus too much on what's happening at the tips, rather than going back and looking at the growth record. What exactly do you see? When we put this together, we have two reality checks in the 20 questions. Reality checks. Cause you, to cause you, to cause me, to cause us to stop. Because remember, one of the biggest pitfalls with diagnostics is going too quickly and rushing to judgment. Does everybody agree with that? So we're saying, stop and ask yourself, wait a second, what exactly am I seeing here? The first reality check. Are you seeing what you think you're seeing? For example, is this just a really big guy or a very small shovel? <laughs> Re review everything and don't jump to conclusions. Did my cohort, Jim Chadfield, fall off her camel or do I just like to work with Photoshop? <laughs> what's wrong with this ash tree? This is what's riding on it, folks. And I get a little strident when I get to this point because here's what's riding on a correct diagnosis. Now, we all know in this room that that thinning canopy could be possibly caused by any one of these or, or two or three coupled together, correct? Any one of these things. However, what about this something else? What exactly do you see? It could be emerald ash borer. But consider the impact when I say this. Unknown prior to 2002. If I was giving this talk in 2001... In fact, May of 2002, because it was discovered in July of 2002, actually a little bit earlier, confirmed in July. If I'd been given this talk then uh, in, in even early 2002, this wouldn't even be up here because we didn't even know it was here. Think how much headache and money, billions of dollars, that's with a B, could be saved had we all stopped at some point, somebody, and said, what exactly do you see? What exactly do you see? You know, there is no other pest that causes D-shaped holes on living ash trees. There's none. Trees were dying right and left. And it turns out, for about 20 years in the Detroit suburbs, but don't jump to too many conclusions, and I've heard people do this, you know, while I do agree with you that nothing good ever comes out of Michigan, 
It's in my contract. I have to do that at least. I've heard people act like it's almost like it is, you know, Detroit or Michigan. Well, no, don't do that. We can't fault because we're all at fault because now how many states have Emerald ash borer populations that have been discovered and how many of those populations pre-existed 2002? A good many of them. A good many of them. So we, uh, many of us probably did see this. What exactly do you see? What exactly do you see? Just a little review. These are metallic wood boring beetles. Kind of pretty when they expand their wing covers. Not big. And not all of them are emerald. There's a, a blue variation. The adults do notch leaves. And they do feed on leaves, but it's not very significant damage. What they do that's so good is, as with all the growlis beetles, they have a flat back and a round belly. So when they emerge from the tree, they can only leave one type of hole, D, as we say D for dead. Emerald ash borer, what exactly do you see? These uh, larvae, which are called flat-headed borers, because of this first thoracic segment, which looks flat and it looks like the head, but that's not what I want to focus on. Look at these big bell-shaped segments. They look like, makes them look like miniature tapeworms. <coughs> and of course, the larvae aren't very big, but that's the stage that kills the tree. They feed beneath the bark. They consume the phloem and cambium and etch the first ring of xylem. So, what are we going to look for? Tree decline and woodpecker activity going after those larvae. However, be kind of careful. I call these the get out of your car symptoms because there are other things that can cause these very same symptoms, right? Other things. But this should cause you to take a closer look. And if you see these serpentine, frass filled, fill in the blank, what's really going on there, galleries on living ash trees, miniature tapeworms on living ash trees, and D shaped holes out of living ash trees that can only be emerald ash borer. Now this is a show and tell, is it not? Except we didn't even know to show and tell this in 2001. That's my point to you today. The reason that it's so important for us to talk about diagnostics is to recognize that if you don't know something's there, there's no way you can teach about it. And that's exactly where we were. And I hate to tell you, but we suspect there are many other non-natives out there that we just haven't discovered. And that's why I'm making such a big deal out of this. What exactly do you see? Always question that. What exactly do you see? I mean, sometimes it can be pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your mind open to all possibilities. That's my point. It could be extraterrestrial. We don't know. No, I <laughs> What do you see on other plants and what is the site? Take a step back, look around. Obviously with drought damage, it's very easy to see this on other plants, uh, see the problem on other plants. But here's a really interesting little uh, case study. I was called out to take a look at these junipers and, and um, you can see that they're dying along the edges, dying. I was really having a problem until I looked down to where we see the grass, you can see the dripping of the roundup. So what do you see on other plants? Sometimes look for other, at other plants to see if the cause could be, so this is roundup damage and that's just, they were just using, uh, using it to take out weeds too close to the junipers. What is the site? This leads to questions regarding texture, pH, drainage, and so forth. What is the site? I call this, uh, these the tree amigos. They're ash trees. Now I am based in Ohio. This is in Butler County, Ohio. Yes, it is a location where emerald ash borer has been found. What is the site? Everybody see the, the site? <coughs> All right, 2005, 2006, we're spinning it forward. Look, you can even see the epicormic growth coming out there, can't you? And it's even, now this tree back here had a little reprieve, 2009. I need to take a 2010 shot. I didn't, or I didn't get a, a chance to. I need to take a 2011. So what do you think? Once again, our good friend, the native clear wing moth. This isn't emerald ash borer. Frass all over the ground. American. Doesn't matter. Proud to be there. <laughs> Big holes. Pupil skin. Here's another tree heavily riddled. What's the overarching problem though? Stress. Exactly. Poor planting site. What is the site? 
the native boars, I mean, if they were true killers, we wouldn't have ash trees. We wouldn't worry about emerald ash borer, right? But these native boars go specifically after stressed trees, stressed hosts. And so the site plays everything into it. pH can be very, very important, obviously. For this reason, you've all seen this. The width of these bands translates into the availability of that nutrient. So the site can play a very substantial role in the health or stress-free condition of the tree. And we can see these with these deficiency symptoms. How do we learn about soil texture, pH, and so forth? Soil test. Out outstanding. Soil test. As Soil Man says, don't guess soil test. <laughs> very, very important. That is how you can diagnostically determine what's going on with the site. Who knows most about the plants and when did the symptoms first appear? This goes along very well together. Now, who knows most about the plant, as many of you have discovered over the years, may not be the person that actually owns the plant. How does that work? You're with a commercial client. I was called out, actually by an arborist, to look at, at a, a commercial office complex. Well, the owner flew up from Florida to meet us. So obviously the owner wasn't on site, didn't know anything about the plants. The arborist was called in by the landscaper as a contract. The landscaper only visits there so, every so often, so kind of didn't know a lot about the plants. I'm not being critical, but that was the situation. But they had called the arborist in to seek help with trees dying. Who actually knew most about the plants were the people, believe it or not, who were in that building and took smoke breaks. And they really helped us to, because they were actually going out and seeing the trees daily. So sometimes it comes down to doing a little detective work. Who really knows what's going on with these plants? When did symptoms first appear? You know, this is a, we all deal with this. It up and died overnight. <laughs> you get called out the big oak tree and totally defoliated in July and well, well, when did this happen? Oh, it looked good last week. I mean, well, oh my gosh, <laughs> did we have a hurricane? What? Symptoms change over time. Leaf scorch doesn't start out all of a sudden with brown coming right into the middle leaf, does it? Starts at the edge, works in. Very, very important to track that. It's crucial to establish the chronology. Oak shot hole leaf miner, when did this damage actually occur? A little test. Right after bud break. When the whole, when, this is when the damage was done. Actually, I know these are two different species of oaks, but shot hole leaf miner will affect several different species. This is chinkapin, and this is a, a burr, I believe, or no, white oak. Point being is, you can see that those holes are made by this little fly at a time when you'd hardly even notice the holes. But once they get larger, they become very apparent. Of course, the fly is long gone. There's no more damage being done. Symptoms, when did the symptoms first appear? Chronology. What is the horticultural history, environmental history? What does the client think the problem is? What has happened? Now, this might sound like that earlier question about who knows most about the plant. It's not, though. The earlier question was to find out. Bird flu strikes the Florida trailer park. It's just a, <laughs> it's just a good thing they can reproduce fast. Well, I can't believe it. I'm glad I'm on tape for this because I have exactly 5.30 and we're at the end. Any quick questions? Outstanding. Well, thanks everybody for coming out.